games. I'm getting out of this crap. <laughs> and if you're the kind of person, if you're that 0.15% of people who says, yeah, I want to do this, welcome. <laughs> You've got what it takes to do this. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Doc are joined by M. Joshua to discuss his work as a game trailer maker and what makes for a good video game trailer. Plus, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, Work Flowy, and Gaming Without a Thumb. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 79 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. What did, what's our catchphrase? Uh, games and new media with a splash of academia. Yeah, that's it. We're without Chris mm. today, if you can't tell. Um, so it's going to be crazy, crazy, I tell you. Uh, so today we have a very special guest with us. Uh, M. Joshua Collar is with us uh, of mjoshua.com. He is a uh, trailer maker for games, and we're going to talk about that whole process of making game trailers, what it means, and what it uh, is supposed to be, and the, the dirty lies that... Uh, such things tell us uh, should should be a lot of fun. Uh, say say hi to the the people out there. Hi to the people out there. I'm so glad that I get to be on the show. I uh, I've listened to a whole two and a half episodes, so I feel like I am uh, remotely not ignorant about the show. No, that makes you our biggest <laughs> fan, actually. So <laughs> yeah. you're, you're definitely on the list. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip. To see what we can learn from games of the past. About last week, uh, I went to this um, arcade um, because I had gotten tired of not playing video games for a while, thanks to my <laughs> thumb. And uh, I found this uh, cabinet over at the local free play called uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Yeah. If y'all are not familiar with uh, the title, I'm sure everyone knows Michael Jackson, but he actually <laughs> produced a feature length film called Moonwalker, which was... Oh, I didn't realize it was a film. Oh, it was a film, and it was sort of like a mixture between um, a music video and an actual movie. Okay, Camille that explains why not that many people remember it. Well, <laughs> it's it's extremely weird, and I didn't even remember yeah. that I had seen it until I started playing the video game, because the video game actually <laughs> follows the same plot. So, oh, wow. essentially, uh, if, I could, if I could explain a little bit about the game for those that don't know... Um, for, for starters, when the Sega Genesis was first being marketed, one of its biggest selling points was that it had a home version of Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Well, I know that's why I didn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've actually not, uh, I actually have played the Genesis version before and wasn't really that impressed. And maybe it's yeah. just because the game works a lot better at the arcades. So the arcade version is actually three players, not four, which is kind of odd. Usually arcades are either two or four. This one's three, but each person gets to play Michael, so no one has to be left out playing some <laughs> scrub. So there's, okay, three Michaels. there's three Michaels, and all, and they just wear different colored jackets, oh. so that's how you can tell the difference. Well, who's the, who's the real Michael? Is that the will, the... will the real Michael Jackson please stand up? I think they're please supposed to up. all be the real Michael. Yeah, except I think that's true. They, they all have um, a special um, magical aura power, right. which, is how yeah. you, which is how you use your ability. So you have basically two attacks in the game. Um, one is your standard attack, which is um, an aura blast that has short range, but if you charge it up, you can shoot across the screen with it. Hmm. Then your other attack is a special move, which you have to actually collect power-ups to use it. It's um, pretty rare, but when you use it, you kill everything on screen, and it's a dance move. So when you yeah. hit the button, Michael Jackson and any other Michaels that are on screen automatically all start dancing with you. Spotlights come down <laughs> to illuminate that. you. And all the enemies on screen dance, too. So they're all dancing. And then <laughs> once, <laughs> of course. And then once they're done dancing, the enemies just explode. Because yeah, yeah. they're just yeah. they had way too much fun dancing, they just blow up. <laughs> the power of Michael Jackson's dance it's... makes your head explode. Oh, That's man. how my aunt 
went out. Yes, and and so the yeah. the the story. This game actually does use a lot of licensed music, uh, Michael oh, Jackson yeah, music throughout the game. Each stage actually has very memorable music. Um, and uh, the story is essentially the same as the film. Uh, there's this character known as Mr. Big, who I think was Joe Pesci in the movie. I, it's been a while <laughs> since I've seen it. Um, but it, it, the arcade game looks like Joe Pesci, so if it wasn't a Joe Pesci in the film, it was like a Joe Pesci lookalike. Um, <laughs> which I don't know why you play Joe Pesci lookalike in like the late 80s to play Joe Pesci. Just, just pay Joe Pesci. But anyway, so uh, Mr. Big has kidnapped a bunch of children. Um, mostly little boys. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not making this uh-huh. up. And Michael yeah. Jackson has to rescue them. Yeah. So um, that's essentially the story, and, and as you go al- around each level, at certain points in the level, they're not not hidden behind bosses. There's just little kids tied up, and you, as Michael, walk up to the little kids and untie them. And then when you untie them, the kid gives you some sort of uh, special ability or a power up or uh, restores your health or something like that. Um, so it's based on real life, in other words. It's based on real yeah. life. Yeah, the actual <laughs> Michael Jackson yes. superhero. Oh, it's, it's, it's very <laughs> surreal, actually. So there's there's a lot of other little quirks about the game, just to, just to name a few of them. Um, yeah. So some of the locations are really kind of interesting. Um, you have, like, um, it seems like a pool, like a pool bar, like some CD bar or something like that where you're dancing, mm-hmm. and yet there's no jump in the game, so you can't jump on top of tables or on top of a stage and start dancing. But I've so seen Michael it, Jackson do that. Exactly. IRL. And I'm pretty sure he does that in the movie, too. Yeah, so it's yeah. really odd that they that they take set pieces from the movie, but they never give your mm. character a jump ability. Mm. Do you think it was because they couldn't quite figure out how to do jumping in an isometric plane? Yeah, it's because the game, and you're right, the game kind of plays at this sort of like a three-quarters view, and you're not... Yeah. It is sort of isometric. I think it's, the camera's a little bit lower than typical for isometric, but it's definitely not straight on. It's a different yeah. sort of beat 'em up than what I'm used to. Um, I gotta say though, when I when I went to that arcade, I played um, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and X Men, all three beat 'em ups, and I had by far I walked away from the other two. I had by far oh, the wow. most fun with Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. I played it all the way through and beat the game. That's fantastic. Now, to be fair, it's not a long game. It's only five stages. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wow. But a couple of things that kept me interested. One, um, the enemies were just. It was it was fun trying to figure out what the enemies were. Like it was weird things, like the Joe Pesci character inside a giant mech suit for some reason. But like yes. you would make you could make him dance was the fun part. So the mech would dance. It would like lift its legs up really robotically, kind of one by almost almost like it's doing some sort of weird goose step is what it looked like. It didn't um, even look like a dance. Like the ending of Tales of Borderlands, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and also this this little things like um, that your uh, Michael Jackson's chimp bubbles in the game. And if you find bubbles, you transform into Mecha Jackson. No. Uh, which is essentially, you're like, you become this um, giant um, half man, half machine, I guess, and you shoot laser beams now instead of your typical aura attack. You become much more powerful. That sounds That sounds pretty awesome. That yeah. It's amazing. Like, it's actually really fun. There's a part of the game later. Oh, by the way, Mecha Jackson is in the movie, too. Uh, there's a, a later part in the game you transform into vehicles at some point. Uh, I don't want to give too. I don't want to spoil too much. I mean, this is this is a pretty feel, awesome story. I feel story. like I remember these things from playing the game, but I only I only could have had like a couple quarters when I played the game, so I'm sure I didn't get very far. Yeah. It, I think one of the things that kept me playing that game, even though um, you know at, at this particular arcade you can play for free once you pay the entry fee, uh-huh. but also the game was really actually quite easy. Um, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it was challenging enough that it kept me interested, but on it, I was much more interested in the enemies, the mechanics. The music, uh, the game flow, and just trying to see, okay, what sort of other weird power up or ability is going to come at me next? Um, that I didn't really seem to mind. That um, I, I died maybe like a total of like five or six times playing all the way through the game. Oh wow! So I play a lot of beat 'em up, so I'm sure that was part mm-hmm. of it. And I ended up as I was playing, I had a couple extra people join me, so I got to experience it both solo and with um, a full set of Michaels, three oh, that's different cool. Michaels. That's really neat. Yes. Um, and I think I was playing the real Michael because I had the white jacket on, the white suit, and that's the suit that he wears in the movie. So I'm just going to go ahead and assume that I was the real Michael, and they were just the imposter Michaels. <laughs> Jim, can you tell me, are you black or white? <laughs> um, I'm surprised that wasn't the, the 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 twist ending at the end, where you, or maybe the big reveal, you get to find out which mm-hmm. which which is he, black or white now. Um, well, he had a whole song about that. He know, did. Black, he did. Black or white. Uh, Isn't that, that the one where he, what it was about? Where he went on the rampage and, and, and like trashed cars for five minutes. Yes. You remember that? That, that was <laughs> live, and people like just couldn't couldn't uh, remember. I mean, they they were they were just stunned. And it, and it sort of went into our collective subconscious as, as Michael Jackson goes down an alleyway and just smashes up cars for five minutes. 
I, Google it. It's, it's, it sounds it's like a, a music video that I've seen. Yeah, you know? it's it's totally a thing, and it went it went live in the like it was in the late eighties, mm. and everybody watched. It. I think it was like NBC or CBS or something. Everybody watched it because it came on right after I don't know sixty minutes or something. Well, I do want to share this uh, the ending real fast Please because share. I, I thought it was quite I, surreal. I, I know that this is going to disappoint a lot of people from you spoiling. You know this. 30 year old game <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say if, if you could find it by the way at the arcades I strongly recommend that you play it okay, cool. but um, so the ending essentially is once you defeat Mr. Big and he has a couple of different forms in his like weird mech suit um, mm-hmm. you and any other Michael Jacksons that you're playing with transform into spaceships well first the kids the kids run out and they say oh yay thanks Michael and they run up and like you know they have like a a touching moment where they all hug Michael, and mm-hmm. then the a Michaels. Moment? Yes, and oh, then I, man. I, yes, exactly. And then my, the Michaels transform <laughs> into um, spaceships, and then they fly off into outer space. Yeah, and you yeah. find out that you were on like I guess you were on another planet. Maybe it was supposed to be Earth, but it doesn't look like Earth as you're flying away. Oh, and yeah. then there's this um, really melodramatic um, text scrawl, and it explains our text scroll, and it explains how um, Michael Jackson flew off, and the kids were left. Um, waiting for their next for Michael to return for their next magical adventure or to take them on a magical adventure I should say yeah which when the game was made I'm sure it was supposed to be this really cool moment for the kids that were playing it but yeah. uh, me playing it as an adult knowing the history of Michael Jackson and some of the allegations yeah. that went his way it or convictions that went that yeah went against well him. <laughs> it just seemed very um I quit it. I quit the whole it. thing was very surreal to me like just playing through the yeah. game but it's that that being the ending yeah. um but I do think I mean, it's, it's there's worth a good playing. reason why this isn't like a good social justice explanation of like a time when girls aren't damseled and instead it's boys. But there's a reason why we don't use that as a shining example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or when you go and watch the Naked Gun movies and and there's OJ, like oh. getting just beat up and trashed because that's his that's his whole thing. Mm-hmm. He's just getting beat up on and you're, and you're just like. I don't know, should I be enjoying this more mm-hmm. or less? Or um, Yeah, it's just like super disorienting. Yeah, it really is. 20 years removed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some. There's definitely some, some weird elements like that when you go back to play some of these old games that feature pop culture icons. Yeah, no mm-hmm. kidding. Well, I'm just impressed that you did all that with a broken thumb. Yes, and that's, yeah. that's another thing I wanted to talk about in this uh, War Story segment. It's time for War Stories. Tales of Tribulation and Triumph in Gaming. During my time at that arcade, uh, I, I was actually hesitant to go at first because I wasn't sure I could actually play the games. Uh, my, my left thumb is still still pretty, pretty pretty in a pretty bad shape, especially a week ago. I really couldn't move it very well. Mm-hmm. What um, did you do to it again? Well, I was um, in jiu-jitsu. I kind of I fell on it in a weird way. I was rolling around okay. with someone and got it caught in his sleeve or my sleeve or gi or whatever and yeah. fell on it and sort of put my full weight and his weight on just my thumb. So oh, I kind man. of, I sprained it, popped it out, slight yeah. break. Um, yeah. Don't listen to him, folks. He beat it, uh, beat the world record of, uh, of thumb movements on the original Mario 3. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm a thumb wrestling world champion. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. Hey, I'm not going to lie. You know, like, jiu-jitsu is a really better, like, a way better excuse than some of the breaks that I've heard. Like, Kids punch breaking their arms because they punched a wall too hard. <laughs> don't, don't punch balls, kids. Yeah, don't don't punch balls. <laughs> yeah, go uh, you know, kill something in uh, the, the the Witcher or Fallout. Mm-hmm. Not not something okay. in your actual house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, leave the uh, the wall punching to the Kool Aid Man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pull that out. Um, so so anyway, so I, I actually decided to go anyway, and I found out um, that. Actually, a lot of the control schemes for arcades suit themselves quite well to not using your thumb. Mm-hmm. So I've actually, I have tried to go and play games with a D-pad with my thumb. In fact, even this, this morning I was playing games with my thumb, and I would get really sore very quickly trying to do quick, mo- quick motions in arcade-type oh, games with, yeah. my, with my thumb on the D-pad. But at the arcade, um, a joystick, you can kind of use your full hand. But I actually had a lot of fun doing things like the little trackball games, like uh, Millipede and Centipede. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or um, I played this copy of uh, Blasteroids there, which was which is kind of a, uh, I think it's the third or the fourth um, Asteroids sort of remake or new Asteroids version. Uh, and it's mm-hmm. really cool, and it has this sort of a dial that you use to, to move your um, ship around screen. And you cool. can actually just use your fingers or part of your palm to control it. Oh, neat. So it's actually actually pretty neat, the sort of stuff that you can do 
Um, I always liked with arcade these sort of control bowling. schemes. I thought arcade bowling was the greatest. Um, don't you use the there's the, a ball the, and it's embedded into the into the controller and, and you just you just like whoosh on the ball. Oh, so it's a full. So it's not like the trackball. It's like a full, like a large sphere. Well, ball. no, it's it's a full. It's a, it's the trackball, but it's big. It's like the size of your fist. Okay. Oh, so it's a really huge track. Yeah, it's just a really big trackball, and mm-hmm. um, it, it's right there in the middle of the console. And you you have like left and right arrows and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. you know. And, and you can you can adjust your your spin and all that stuff. But then ultimately, what it comes down to is you you go up to that thing and you just go whoosh with your hands, and it, it kind of goes and does its thing. Is that similar to what they use for Golden Tee? Like the large, because the golf game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. They do the same thing. They have like a really large trackball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I I, I like those kind of things. And and, you know, you lose something like that in, uh, like in the home space. You know, there's a lot of of really cool solutions like the Wii and and all that kind of thing. But man, I just I just miss that arcade creativeness whenever it's built in to the arcade machine. So, Mm -hmm. uh, so there you go. Uh, For those of you who have broken thumbs. Uh, you can still go to the arcade because you're going to be using your whole hand and sort of that 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 you know palming action mm-hmm. with the joystick. There you go. Yeah, I, I thought it was. I also uh, found out that I, I played some of the Play Choice cabinets. You know, they have those um, Play Choice Ten where Nintendo put a bunch of they put ten actually on each cabinet uh, Nintendo Entertainment System games. Mm-hmm. Um, and then put them out of the arcade. You can sort of select which game you wanted to play. It had a joystick and buttons. Yeah. And um, I actually had a lot, of, a lot of fun playing some of those, too. Um, even games that I didn't really think would lend themselves well to arcade sticks actually worked, controlled pretty well. Like, for example, um, Metroid, I thought, worked surprisingly well with a... Oh, I bet that one's great. With a joystick. Um, mm-hmm. Super Mario Brothers 2 worked mm-hmm. really well. Um, well, you know, back in those days, they actually did have home joysticks that you yes. could buy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we think yeah, yeah. in terms of the, the little standard, you know, rectangular controller, but they were selling these big old... The NES Advantage. Yeah. It actually, that's it, what it was called. That's yeah, right. That's, that's what, what it was, was called. That's yeah. right. It has a really good reputation to this day for being mm-hmm. a, a solid home um, joystick, mm-hmm. an arcade controller, mm-hmm. uh, be, mainly because it had a lot of weight to it. Like That's been a yeah. big big problem that people have when they take these home, because at the arcade, it's attached to this, you know, like 400-pound cabinet, so it doesn't move. Right. At home, you're always in this awkward position. Do you put it on your lap? Do you stick it on a table? You How do you hold it. it? You duct tape it down. Right. Or, or, or do you tape it down? Some people actually will do that. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, I'm sure you're kidding, but people no, do that. No, I'm not actually yeah. kidding. That's what, I, that's um. what I've seen done. <laughs> so the Ness Advantage actually got a good reputation because it had enough weight to it that, mm-hmm. you know, you didn't have that problem That's where it cool. would move around when you're hitting it. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. All right, so I got a little change of pace for us. I want to talk about, it's an app, but it's also a website, but it's also, but it's also, but it's also, right? Really, it falls into the category of transmedia, especially if you are someone who does a lot of writing, maybe that's writing papers, maybe it's writing fiction, whatever it is, and it's called Workflowy. All one word, W-O-R-K-F-L-O-W-Y. And the reason I want to talk about it is because it's a very simple outlining tool. Basically what you do is you put bullet points on things and then there's sub-bullet points to that and sub-bullet points to that. And then the very simple function is a completed button. And so you complete uh, very specific things or you don't and you can do anything from your grocery list to uh, notes for the novel that you're working on. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal except you got to understand that the way that I write, um, like right now for example, I'm working on a uh, a couple of different projects that have to do with the Templar setting. Uh, Doc and Kruger Games is working on a Templar mm-hmm. setting for, for a mind um, uh, set, a system and a couple of other things, and so I'm working on a novel within that context. Kind of like uh, like to think of it as the the Lord of the Rings for America, because it turns out in 1308 uh, they they came to America. Who knew? Uh, but uh, all of that is to say that as I'm taking a uh, a medieval class right now and various other things, stuff pops into my head as it always does whenever I work on a project, and I'm like, oh. That needs to go in the novel. Or, oh, that needs to go in a system. Or, oh, that needs to... And and every single day I come up with a new story idea and I want to list it or put it somewhere. So typically what I've done is I've just put that into a text file on my phone. 
And usually I'll dictate it, and, and Siri has various uh, levels of success in, 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 <laughs> in writing it down for me. Uh, but what happens is, when I get home then, sometimes I'll remember to look at that, and sometimes I won't. And there's always a secondary process where you have to then go look at your notes and try to cross-reference it. Enter Workflowy. Workflowy's mm-hmm. got this app that you can put on your phone, and you can do that within the context of, for example, if you have a storyline, you know exactly where in the storyline that's going. You just pop it in right there. Then when you get home, you pull up the website, and it's there. It's all hmm. the way that you've done it. it. It coordinates across all of your devices, and it's already sort of embedded into this outline or work line or workflow, whatever it is, there, thus the name, uh, that you are actively working on with the project that you're working on. So let's say I'm at the grocery store, and I suddenly come up with an outline for that paper I need to write, outcomes workflowy. I go ahead and I just start a new list. I type it in. I, I give myself the sub points, and I'm done. Mm-hmm. There's really no reason not to do it sort of anywhere and everywhere because, uh, you know, we've got the Internet in our pants. So, uh, as, as we say in our <laughs> intro, it's uh, it's really been sort of an amazing thing from a design perspective for me uh, to just have that uh, and, and stick it in and have it whenever I need it, where I need it, in an, and in, organized in the way that I need it to be organized. Hmm. So cool. check it out, Workflowy. Uh, it's free, and it's really pretty cool because every time you make a change, they'll email you at the end of the day uh, a summary of what you did. Awesome. I like the word free. I yeah. caught that, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'll check it out. Yeah, I'm always taking notes on stuff that I'm doing too, so the idea of putting it all in one place is really handy. Yeah, and the fact that it coordinates across your devices. Like, i got an iPad that I work from sometimes and, and uh-huh. that kind of thing. So usually if I've got it all up on, um, you know, like the... Uh, What's that? What's that thing called? Where the eye uh, just lost it? I lost the my cloud. Mind. The cloud. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so usually, if you got it like up on the cloud or something, mm. um, you know, you can you can pull it up. You can pull up the file, whatever it is. But I don't know. There's just something different about this one. The way that it's dynamic. The way that you can pop it out. The way that you can say it's finished. It just feels like it's moving you through that process of being more productive. Um, yeah, I don't know. Awesome. Mm. This week's meaty topic of discussion. M. Joshua, uh, you you are the the M. Joshua of M. Joshua dot com. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, why why do we care? Who 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 are you? Uh, tell uh, us yes. about yourself. <laughs> Cool. So I uh, I make player centric game trailers. My my main day job, my main goal, aspiration, all those things is eat, breathe, and drink game trailers. Um, and so the reason why I want I, I just wanted to to like share like what that what that process is like. Why um, what it's like transitioning uh, a very interactive, uh, complicated experience into a. 60 to 90 second uh, summary of that uh, interactive experience and that's static. It doesn't move. Um, it's this complicated thing that I just really, really love. Um, so I, I appreciate you uh, calling me out. Um, people probably know me most from uh, the trailer for That Dragon Cancer um, or uh, Polybridge or Starbreak. There's, uh, there's a lot of trailers that I've done. It depends upon your interest in your circles, kind of which one I lead with. Um, but um, I'd probably lead with that Dragon Cancer because it kind of captures what's unique about my approach. And it's kind of like a little bit of a, an easy answer. It's like, well, I want to bring back the emotional journey of players' experience with games uh, and trailers. Because like, when you go to a movie trailer, like, all right, uh, for you guys, have you ever watched a movie trailer and cried? Uh, no. No? Okay. Not that I would admit to. Is- how, about, how about you, Duck? Uh, what what movie are you talking about? Have you ever watched any movie trailer and cried? Oh, I thought you were like and cried. I don't know that film called and cried. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it is it A N N or A N N E? No. no um, <laughs> gee, um, have I ever watched? You know what? Probably not in the theater in, yeah. in in that way. But there have certainly been like some short films that have done that. Brought me sort of to the edge of it. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say there's that many films who have that that have actually you know brought me to tears. Oh wow! The most recent one uh, definitely would be uh, Pixar's animated film um, about all the different people inside the mind. 
Which, which uh, film is that? Out. Yeah. Inside Out. Oh yeah, yeah. that was that. that oh, I, at, at the end of that one, yeah, tears were shed. Um, but that wasn't the trailer. Though. But that what, was no, the it wasn't. Movie, right? It wasn't the trailer. Well, I, I, um, I will say that like the first. All right, I I cry a lot at the movies, so like I am will. Okay, I'm willing to admit that. <laughs> um, I actually like got to. Uh, this was terribly unexpected. And it was the first time that I've gone to theaters in a while, so I'm not sure if that was related to it because uh, we had a kid, but. Um, Pete's Dragon. I actually got like snotty because I was crying so much. Okay, I will give you Pete's Dragon. First time I ever <laughs> saw Pete's Dragon, I cried. I was a, I was a kid, mind you, but oh wow. Oh, so the original Pete's Dragon. The original I'm, I'm Pete's Dragon. The, You're talking the one the new just, one? Yeah, oh, okay, the new one that just recently remake. came out. Yeah, I had no idea. Um, it's really, really, really good. Uh, I mean, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so I, I I I like I have a lot of like these deep reactions to things, and like I feel I, I feel like for whatever reason, like I can feel much more through. Uh, film and media than I maybe can sometimes in person, which you know whatever whatever you want to say about no, that. That's, but. Honestly, that's actually pretty common, and um, yeah. I've, I've actually read a lot about that, and I, I feel the same way. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. a big reason for that is that uh, when you look at a, especially when it comes to film, uh-huh. um, but I think video games have this ability too, and they can uh-huh. distill what is usually. Um, a hard to define kind of human experience that takes uh-huh. place over a very long period of time, and they kind of distill it into these very short moments, short and powerful mm-hmm. moments. Exactly, um, and that's why you you experience so much. Whereas in real life, you know, say even something horrible and tragic happens, you know, like say like you know your your father dies or something, uh-huh. um, the way that it hits you and you experience it is not going to be in this one powerful moment it's going to be yeah. this sort of long droning experience of, and you're going to be super disoriented the entire time because right. you don't know what you're feeling you don't know how things are going through and um one of, one of my favorite effects in cinema is when uh you see the events continue to unfold uh but there's the the ringing in the ear that just continues and you, mm-hmm. you don't actually hear anything in the scene you just see the scene go forward and like you're like i know that feeling <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, yeah that's, that's how i deal with trauma um <laughs> <laughs> well, fact, but, saving Saving Private Ryan just hit Netflix, and mm-hmm, I'm, yeah. I, I've, I've queued it up, and I've almost hit the button a couple of times because yeah. you want to talk about films that, that made me cry. That that was one of them. Yeah. I saw it in the theater, and then I went back and saw it in the mm-hmm. theater. Um, you know, I, I I enjoy movies as a social experience. I don't enjoy yeah. them as a private experience per oh, se. Okay. But that's yeah. one of those movies where I went back and I saw it by myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just sticks in my mind. And so it's a powerful film. Yeah, it's a powerful, yeah. and, it, and it has that exact thing you're talking so, about. Have you ever had that experience with a game, like anything oh, remotely yeah. along? Okay. Oh, big time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. And there's another part of that too. I mean, is is it's not just they're taking the experience and distilling it, but it's also, of course, the musical element to it. I mean, yeah. that's a big part oh, of, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have a soundtrack that's playing during our life when we have these moments. You don't? No. Of yeah. all people, Jim, I thought you would have one. <laughs> you don't have like a, a Spotify playlist specifically for like. I'm going through a sad go. moment right now. You know, <laughs> you go out on your on your first date. You're like, hang on, just a second, yeah, just a moment. I gotta gotta cue up the soundtrack. Wait. You know, it's that's gonna happen at some point. We're gonna uh, we're gonna actually yeah. have that in yeah. real life. People are gonna have like a, a soundtrack playing in their head at all times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, once we're wired, mm-hmm. we're wired um, listening. So I I I, I kind of like entered into the whole game trailer side of things because I noticed that a lot of people make game trailers. Uh, that are like, hey, here's my game, here's a list of features, and, uh, yeah. And then you get to the end of the trailer, and you're like, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I've I definitely seen those trailers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I don't always know that it's because the game isn't super savvy. I think it's often because um, developers don't think in terms of emotional journey, in terms of the player. Because, um, I mean, like, they live in a world where they're building features into the game. It's just mm-hmm. feature, 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 feature. Uh, is this all working right? Yes or no? Um, it's it's kind of this binary thing. Um, and so for me, coming into it from uh, the, the storyteller's perspective is, like, how do we bring back that arc? Um, and a lot of... Uh, okay, so, like, That Dragon Cancer was, like, a really easy, obvious choice for, like... Because it's, it's a narrative game. It's about something that's super harrowing and painful... Um, but the, the trick for that, for me, with going into that particular trailer was like, all right, well, everyone has their expectations. It's a game about dealing with child uh, with, with um, terminal childhood cancer. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's the assumption? Uh, this is going to be too much. No one's going to be able to handle it. And no one's going to want to play it. Uh, that's the assumption. Um, and, and we got a lot of those responses, a lot of those comments throughout uh, the, the many, many views. Um, and Yeah, I have to admit, that was my first reaction when I heard about the game. 
Yeah, yeah, and and that's just the assumption is that like, all right, that's going to be where like, I don't want to play a game where you're you know dealing with uh, dehydration um, while going through chemo chemo radiation. Uh, that 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 okay, that that doesn't have any appeal. Um, however. Um, so our, our challenge was to, to bring that not only into a palatable experience, but into a invitation to see something that would add to your life. And that's the thing that was really, really important for me was like, I, I, the moment that I heard about this game over four some odd years ago was that's a game that's going to add, like, I feel like I feel the benefit of playing that kind of game. Um, but most people don't have that kind of like active imagination for, um, how this is going to be a, a good thing. Um, it's, it's, it's just like, it's, it just sounds like a feel bad game. So when I played through the game, the biggest surprise that I had is like, I, I've cried a lot in games. I cried, I cried into the moon. I cried in the walking dead. I cried, um, heck I, I cried I, in so many games. I can't even keep track of all walking of them. dead's a good example. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I even cried at like weird times in those games, but like the, the, the main, the main thing that I realized was that, uh, I didn't cry very much playing, uh, that dragon cancer, which, yeah. which was, um, I don't know how much of that was because I was play testing it directly with uh, Ryan Green while I was, mm-hmm. while, you know, while, like he was watching me while I was playing. But I felt like all the experiences that I was having were, were pretty authentic. Um, and it could, it could be that whole like going through trauma, like you're not fully feeling it kind of thing. Um, but the main thing that was my takeaway with the game, and the main thing that I wanted to capture in the trailer, was that how much joy there was, like how many times I was laughing. Which was the big surprise. Like I was, I was legitimately laughing, legitimately smiling, legitimately experiencing like these moments of great joy in celebrating this little boy's life. And so I wanted to make sure that that was what came through in the trailer. So you have this a- ambition and expectation. Nice. And then you get to subvert. I, I got to like at least try to subvert that. Um, now a lot of people, I don't think that necessarily stuck a ro- the whole way through the trailer because you know there's that 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 ambition, that expectation mm-hmm. that you're that you're not willing to see past, but. Um, so that, that that's that's one of the things that really got me into this this journey of, of game trailers is um, you, you you typically have this emotional expectation that you have with a game. It's like um, I don't know, like some, something that's super hyper violent. You have the expectation that yeah, it's violent, and that's like the whole thing. But like if you really are playing a super violent game, more than likely you're spending most of that time defeated, dying. Oh yeah, and that's getting true. angry because you're getting up again, and you're like, okay, I'm going to live this time, and you're so mm-hmm. hyper focused on actually staying alive that it's no longer about the acts of violence that you're committing to others as like an expression of rage, but a matter of tension, your personal mm-hmm. tension of stress and survival, and just simply staying in the game. That's and a good so, point. yeah, that's, no, very, very much so. I mean, I when I recently played Doom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all the way through the new Doom, it's it's very much yeah. like that. It's of course Doom a very is violent such a great game, example. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's it's extremely tense the whole game. I mean, you're not. You don't have well, time except for to when you clear a room and it becomes an exploration game, and suddenly it becomes the uh, it becomes like this this weirdly serene moment, like uh, that's the only I've seen in like Metroid, mm-hmm. where you're like, all right, everything's empty, and now I get to just look for missiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, well, you make an interesting connection there because um, you know I I used to teach a lesson called the good, the bad, and the ugly, and in mm-hmm. fact, we did an episode called that a, a while back, mm-hmm. and the idea behind the entire uh, question for the class was, mm-hmm. um, you know, do video games uh, cause violence and, and mm-hmm. do video games cause a mental, uh, you know, change in behavior and that kind of a thing? Uh-huh. Yeah. And and the answer is, it's a double-edged sword because the answer is, is, is supposed to be yes. The, the yeah. video games do cause a emotional reaction in us. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. do cause us to change our behavior. They do cause us to do these things just like good literature, a, uh-huh. a good film, a television show that has an impact upon us. Uh-huh. Um, music. Yeah, music, great yeah, yeah, great yeah. example. Mm. Because because it's art. Yeah. And, and, and good art is going to do that. We're going to walk away from, from a beautiful painting and, and our life is going to be changed. Yeah. Uh, because that that's the purpose of the thing you know that's yeah. the purpose of the of the the piece if you will and, and so often i think that we li- live in that space of this impacted me but i don't have words for it and so there's mm-hmm. often this this created um impact space uh that that we just don't have the the verb set for uh communicating about where are we how do we feel about these things uh, and so that's one of my favorite things with games criticism games literature um and uh trailer creation is this idea of like how do we develop the new verbs how do we understand 
what this what, what this is causing within me. And uh, the reason why I got into making trailers is because I, I just couldn't stop writing about games. Like, I couldn't stop engaging in every single, like, not every single game that comes out, because that's literally impossible and retarded. <laughs> yeah. But um, to just, like, understand why. Like, the so my background in writing probably primarily goes back to uh, writing at Game Church. Um, and not getting into like the faith side of that, because I'll save that for another dis- discussion, but specifically extrapolating the virtues within games. Uh, and that was the core thing. It's kind of the kill screen style of games writing, which is less about writing reviews and more about writing um, what is the underlying uh, virtue that is explored in this theme and how do we relate to that both mechanically and thematically. Um, so uh, an example of that might be, um, I don't know, in To the Moon, how there's a particular character who has Asperger's, and they never explicitly say this, um, but they create this amazing character who um, you get to understand her journey, and so much of the game you think it's about your character, but it's really about his understanding of her, and, mm-hmm. and understanding her experience with that, um, with that syndrome, and kind of having grace for her, having, having, uh, and seeking reconciliation in that relationship, um, despite so much of the assumptions and interactions between those things. And that's just this silly 16 bit looking, uh, non, non violent, uh, RPG. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are the kinds of experiences that I, I just wanted to, uh, See how how much how much more are there things like that out there, and how why aren't we talking about that? Because our, our literacy in games is so oriented towards is it good? Like that's 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 as far as it typically goes right. in terms in terms of like culture and whatever. I I, I want to talk about a game to someone. It's like is it good? I'm like well, if if you have a brain, you're gonna find good in it. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you if you have biases against this particular genre and assumptions against it, you're not gonna be able to find the good in it. Right. Um, but how about we break, change the the discussion to um, how does it affect you? What are your exper- What is your experience with it like? Mm-hmm. How does it change you? Um, okay, so yeah. one one of the challenges that I personally um, see in in I mean because we've we've all pretty much done our own writing um, uh-huh. sure. in in this field and compared games to X, whatever X might oh, be, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we were just talking about comparing them to film and to books and other things, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of uh, one of the, I guess, uh, really great comparisons that um, we've done, and, and I wasn't a part of this discussion, but uh, uh, on the show in the past, is comparing games to a television series uh-huh. because of the, the flow, the mm-hmm. sort of up and down and up and down and up and down. And because you're yeah. talking about 18 hours of content for a short game and hundreds of hours of content for a long game, 100 hours of content on a TV series is literally into, what, the fourth season, fifth season? Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, um, well, at least... Probably. It's like it's a big a big hallmark. Whenever a show hits its hundredth episode, it's it's a huge deal. I'm just realizing right now how much of my life I wasted watching every episode of Grey's Anatomy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that's okay. I've I've watched all of Stargate at least three times. So, oh, um, yeah, I've watched every Star Trek series at least three times all the way through. Oh, wow. The ones that I really liked, I've watched about five or six yeah, but times. At least you can find a majority of, well, let's let's just call them nerds, um, who would agree that that's worth the time. Oh, it is yeah, worth yeah, it. Yeah. It was worth the time. You have to search for very specific yeah. fans to, to find I, Stargate I, uh, I will say with, quality. With, with television, um, I, I will say that a lot of series, except for the ones that actually have actually less number of episodes, when we talk about something like Star Trek, mm-hmm. um, the character development tends to happen in short bursts. Sure. Whereas if a show that has a lot less episodes, like, say, Breaking Bad, that mm-hmm. had a lot of um, very strong character arcs. A lot of characters changed over the course of the series. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But each each um, season was, what, 10 episodes? Mm-hmm. So you look huh. at something like... Uh, sort of a British model. Yeah. Or Canadian model. Well, but it's it's the new American model, too. It is. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I yeah. think Come that... Um, you look at video games, I think they follow that... Um, as well, like they tend to have when they do have characters, and this is not this is not a new convention, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, games with with uh, storytelling, a storytelling focus, like a lot of um, role playing games, mm-hmm. do have um, this sort of gradual character development mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, throughout the game. You know, and I, and I was thinking, I was reminded of something, especially when you talked about games that you know had an emotional impact. Some of the early ones that I've played, um, like that, like for example, Chrono Trigger, um, for me was Good like example. that. 
um, the characters in that particular game do develop and change. Um, oh, yeah. Interestingly, the one who does not is the main character, Chrono, but because he's sort of your your avatar in the game world. Right. But he's every a, other he's an character. Empty character you fill with your own right mm-hmm. and he has a very he has slight personality traits but really it's supposed to be you mm-hmm. um, yeah. but every every other character in that game actually has you know a beginning point of who they are and what their personality is and they want to change and then the rest of the game sort of shows this gradual development mm-hmm. um, and so I do think that kind of fits that model of, of television but more so this almost more like a mini series than it does a long form television show because mm-hmm. When you have a show like, for example, Breaking Bad, I mean, I know it was a series, but it was planned out from start to finish. Yeah, it was. So they knew ABC where, story arc, yeah. right? So they knew where the characters were going to go. When you're looking at something like even things like the Star Trek series, they didn't know how many seasons they were going to go for. So they have to get their storylines in and their character development in when they feel like it makes sense to do so. Mm-hmm. They have to tell their story essentially right away or within that season, like they tended to do season arcs because they didn't know how many seasons it was going to be. Yeah, that makes sense. So with the game, you know you know your ending points. You're able to yeah. do that. So yeah, I think I think definitely games have that sort of comparison. Yeah, uh, and so I guess what all that leads to the next logical question is, how do you take that knowledge whenever you make a game trailer for something, knowing that you're making a game trailer for something that might potentially have, if not 18 hours of content, hundreds of hours of content, mm-hmm. and also and also the fact that in not not in every game, but there's lots and lots of games where people have different experiences. Um, you may not, you know, most games typically because of the interactive interactive nature of gaming, um, even if it's a linear story that you're going through, like, say, Doom, for example, it's a linear game, but my experiences in Doom might not match another player because there's so many different ways you can approach the challenges. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I would say that the, the, one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, game trailer creators was a guy who um, was kind of a pen pal of mine, Kurt Gartner. He made a uh, a uh, ton of trailers. He's the the guy who does Devolver's trailers um, right now, and he says the number one most important thing of any game trailer is variety. Uh, mm. Maybe not the most important, but you know, like anytime you talk to anybody who creates anything, they're going to say this is the most important thing, and then this is the most important thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of the point. Is like variety is that um, when you say that there are all these things within a particular experience, and you and you cut them very very close to one another. Um, that kind of overloads the senses, and that sense mm. of overload, I can't handle this. All many, oh, oh, wow, all these things happening at once. You can't process the emotional roller coaster of all of that. You just know chaos. That's kind of like your, your emotional takeaway towards the climax of most trailers. But when you see those different scenes, different shots, different things all lined up back to back, you're like, holy crap, this is a media experience. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's kind of like the shorthand, if you will, of of trailers um but when you make a game like all right so uh, honestly i have made uh the biggest game that i've made a trailer for in terms of content wise would be polybridge um that game is uh there's like over a hundred in-game user levels there's like literally thousands and thousands of user created um levels there's uh, a community, there's a workshop within the game there, Like it, it has kind of like an endless potential of how many hours you could play the game um, and so kind of what we did was say like alright here's here's all right, there's, there's, there's like several arcs to a, a trailer the things that are the most important the first thing to me is literacy build literacy, like how to read this game teach kids how to think that they're a power ranger who knows kung fu like <laughs> make, make them think that they know how to like punch like the putties or whatever, and then they'll go and practice it for the next you know every time they're on the on the, the playground. Um, but once you get to the end of the trailer and you get to those like like the tons of variety of all the shot 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 kind of moments, people are going to think that they know how to play because you if you built that literacy in the earlier parts. And so my main amb- ambition and aspiration is to create a flow of understanding in the front end and so that once you get towards the end of things it all makes sense when you are literally overloaded and you can't actually comprehend what's happening but you subconsciously think that you understand what's happening um and so then when someone watches a trailer so say for example um have you guys heard of enter the gungeon uh yes Yes, I have. Okay, cool. So, Enter the Gungeon is this top-down uh, twin-stick shooter, uh, roguelike that's mm. like super duper exhaustive. And, and and the game that I played the most this year is my favorite game this year. Um, but the the trailer 
Um, I, I go back and rewatch the trailer a lot, and this is something that Kurt Gartner made, and it has. It's just a good. This is just a good gameplay trailer. It's not the most impressive thing. It's not. It's not going to like set the world on fire. But like, I go back to that trailer, and every time I do, I see something that I've never seen in the game. After a hundred hours with this game, I see something in that trailer that I've not seen before. Just because there's little tiny details that all string together, and I don't remember any of those things. Um, but that's kind of the experience that you have with trailers. Is when you come back to them, you don't remember everything that you see, mm-hmm. but you remember what how it made you feel. And that's the core takeaway is, uh, and it's just a cliche that my sister used to always tell me when I made her feel bad, was um, people don't remember what you tell them, but they remember how you make them feel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's true. so true. No, I, so let me ask you this, um, since you're, you're so ens- just ensconced in that area of huh? game trailers. Yeah, sure. Um, what would you say is, is the game trailer that to you that had the most effect or like you saw it and you said whoa this is really powerful um maybe i should do something like this no man's sky (laughs) (laughs) i hope that's not your pick no 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 uh so there's there's a couple um that really stand out to me um and they're not in that of themselves the best trailers in the world or the best games um but they speak to me a lot um the the one that i think is truly a fantastic trailer was kurt gartner's trailer for um offspring fling um, and it is just this wacky, over-the-top 1990s-style commercial with a guy's face right up in the screen and, like, these cute little creatures being, th- like, plushies being thrown out his head. And then you see sh- scenes in the game, and it's just like this, whoa, awesome! And, like, this 1990s, like, feel, but a game for today. And that's Offspring Fling, so check that out. Um, the other one that really stands out to me is, um, have you guys heard of uh, 17-Bit Studios... Uh, Galaxy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I yeah, played. yeah. Yeah. Um, so Galaxy is um, this pretty solid roguelike uh, shooter with with you know with shmups inspirations, um, but the 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 actual gameplay trailers that they show are so like nineteen eighties cartoon. Uh, anime, like, like very like, clearly... like Voltron or like Robotech kind yeah, of inspired. Yeah, yeah. Ro- mm-hmm. Robotron meets, yeah, Gun- like Gundam and all those things all just slammed together with awesome and kind of like over the top lasers everywhere. Except for the actual game, it's kind of slow. Yeah, actually, I I felt the same way when I saw the trailer. That's what what got me to um to get the game. The combat and when I is the game, so intense and I. I honestly, I didn't like the game for that reason because the trailer made me think it was one way, and I started yeah. playing the game. I, sh- I need to go back and explore it again with a op- more of an open mind. But the trailer so, got me thinking it's one way, but the gameplay itself, like you say, is actually quite different. Uh, that brings and up so a really I good question. Say that, I wouldn't say that it's. This is the tension. So, like, how honest are you going to be about your game? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's the thing is like there's the hype factor, right? Uh, right. You already brought up No Man's Sky, and I can't say that No Man's Sky's trailers are bad. I really can't. No, they're because, great. Because they, the capture, they, they capture your imagination, and when you actively capture a person's imagination and let them think where it could potentially go, it's no you can no longer own where it's going to go. Um, they, they've taken that, and it's become something else. And that's the whole thing. Whenever you tra- transition a game from code to in a player's hands, it becomes something else. It's no longer yours. Um, and so there's this some, there, there's this weird disconnect that's tr- you're trying to get from point A to point B. And most games, most games have the opposite problem, where you can't actually understand what the heck is going on in the game or get your imagination into it. Uh, so I really, really like the, the game trailers that you remember that that you end up hating a game for uh, a million years later. I'd say that those trailers are actually probably still really great trailers. Um, that makes a lot of sense. No, that, and that and that's why I, I specified trailers and not yeah the games that they're for because uh, sometimes the trailer is excellent and the game itself either doesn't live up to the trailer or doesn't quite. Um, you know, the trailer might capture elements of the game that aren't necessarily exactly. there. Exactly. And if you look at any any big AAA trailer, um, more than likely there is no gameplay in that trailer. There's oh, game, yeah. there's active game footage. Yeah, or a um, cutscene or something. But I, like, I think... especially in 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 um, shooters, like you might see a lot mm-hmm. of like in engine action, um, but more than likely you're not going to see the first person gameplay because watching a person play first person perspective. And the actual mouse and joystick movement of moving from point A, like, it's disorienting. It's shaky camera. It's bad, bad video production. 
That's right. Um, you no, know, I think you, you look at the trailers for, um, and I think Rockstar does an excellent mm-hmm. job, but all mm-hmm. of Rockstar's games, the Grand Theft Auto, Red Dead Redemption, Bully, um, uh-huh. their trailers typically are maybe movie. 90, 95% um, cutscenes yeah, in the movie. game. Mm-hmm. And That's what they're selling. They're the selling music. the movie aspect of them. <laughs> right. They know that, that their name and that you implicatively know they are open world games is right. going to sell. So that's not going to help yes. the indie guy who's making uh, an eight, you know, like like a sixteen bit style looking game that like no one has internal understanding of their genre. Yeah, yeah no, and no yeah. one's heard of that particular you know developer, and they don't know what they've done before, and, and so, so they're going to go into it fresh. Challenges with that, right. and so for me, I love. I, I would kind of be bored a little bit with uh, like I don't like getting into uh, like super high end. Uh, special effects like that for me is boring like that's like I'm going to have to spend a uh, hundred hours of my time making sure that every scene is perfectly color corrected and has the uh, appropriate lighting and all these that's that's awful to me like I just want to get to what is the core interactive experience like and how does that affect players um, and so some of the trailers that I'll, my personal favorite trailer from last year is one called uh, affordable space adventures it was a Wii U exclusive <laughs> Hmm. And the are you laughing, Doc? Because you I know love that, that title. That's oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. It's, 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 it's already it's, compelling me, and I don't even know what it is. Right, right, right. So uh, it's uh, you are controlling a spaceship, and it's barely held together, and that's part of the appeal. But in the trailer, um, it's a Wii U exclusive, meaning that there's, they do something special with a Wii U controller. It's probably the only Wii U controller-based game that I know that does something truly interesting, because you're controlling all your ship's controls with the Wii with with a, with a pad. And so there's a lot of things that you have to manage on the, on your pad, and then there's also, of course, what's going on on the main screen. Mm-hmm. And that's cool. That's cool. Uh, but then you also have the other players. And so you can have your teammates who are also con- who are who are basically dealing with your ship's maintenance while you're trying to pilot on the big screen, and while you know you're all controlling different parts of the whole thing coming together. Hmm. And and that cooperative aspect of the gameplay is actually what caught my attention because they brought in uh, so they have like this really great smooth motion graphic diagram kind of thing happening on screen and then all of a sudden you see the player reactions when they're like trying to, to manage all their stats and then the ship just explodes and they're like oh man and that kind of player reaction is what really caught my attention um, because for me it's 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 so hard to capture emotion in a game when you can't see a person's face and often when you're showing games, you're not allowed to show a person's face. Like, imagine imagine in the trailer for uh, for The Witcher 3, and you watch, all of a sudden you see a guy's face being like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that gameplay the reminds graphics. me of a board game called Space Cadets. Because oh, everybody's yeah. doing a different thing in real time. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. trying to manage the bridge of a ship. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, so... Um, if you have a Wii, it's. It, uh, I am embarrassed to say that I have not been able to play that game, Affordable Space Adventures, yet. But the trailer captured me, and I got to talk to the devs a little bit because. Send your donations it. to mjoshua.com. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's it's this this um, the capturing the player's emotional journey is very very hard to do um, because. You don't have a face. Uh, this is the, my my son is six months old right now, and the first thing that he connected with was my face and my wife's face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, and so throughout all of our lives, we are programmed, hardwired as human beings to connect with other people's faces. And the reason why Rockstar and all the big studios show faces in their game trailers and their cinematics is because they know you're going to be able to connect with that person's facial animation because they trust that they have you know their 85 billion you know. $80 million budgets that are allowing them to have that realistic detail in their games to express and ca- connect with people's emotions on a deep human basis. Absolutely. Uh, if you're a guy who's making a game on 26 grand and you're barely able to afford a trailer at all, and you're not really quite able to do that. <laughs> Um, and so that you run into a lot of other challenges. Of course, if you're making a local multiplayer game, you can show people, you know, you can show people's faces because you're selling the experience of people getting together. Um, but that's not going to be everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think you bring up a, a good point about um, you know the, those challenges of you if you if you make a game in. in Retro style, you're not necessarily going to have the advantage of being able to show faces, at least unless mm-hmm. you had cutscenes that were, you know, motion video cutscenes. If you go back to old yeah. um, games that they were selling in, uh, particularly in the um, 80s, on like say the Nintendo, and some some of that 
bled over into the Super Nintendo era, mm-hmm. um, and yeah. even even the a little bit beyond that. Commercials, oh man! But they were a lot of times they would use they would use um, you know live cool. action. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why I referenced the the Offspring Fling trailer because it's like pulling off of that that kind of era of game, um, mm-hmm. and and it, and it works to some degree. Like it works to some degree um, because, but you also run into the challenge of like, okay, the biggest question that player has for a game is, what do I do in it? And is it going to be worth my money? Am right. I going to be able to get value out of this long term? And so you have kind of like this, uh, I, I like to call it a quagmire of like all these different things that you have to try to do. You have to teach them how to play the game. You have to teach them what the heck you're doing in the game. You have to teach them uh, what, it, what, what is the emotional journey that you're going to be experiencing. you got to show that there's plenty of value, that they're going to be wanting to play this for a long period of time. What is the name? you got to remember to show your name. I can't tell you how many game trailers <laughs> I've, I've consulted on or seen that like they forgot to tell their name. <laughs> Or show, Oops. Yeah, it's like uh, you might have mentioned it in the dial in the voiceover, but you didn't actually like show it on screen. So you might want to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got all these things, and that's that's the thing. Like it's this uh, it's this mess of like it's it's a problem. It's like this 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 puzzle of sorts, and you got to figure out how to put it all together. Um, so five years ago, do you guys know who Jason Vandenberg from Ubisoft is? He's yeah. uh yeah, 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 yeah. He um now he's the current li- the director of For Honor. Um and I saw him talk maybe five years ago. It was like back back well before I was actually like taking games, writing games, production, all those things seriously. And he he just kind of like outlined the actual dilemma of creating a game. Like he's like Whenever you, whenever so a players play a game from Ubisoft, they're like, "Oh man, you guys didn't do enough of this right, and you didn't do enough of that right, and you didn't get all of this right." And he's like, "All right, yeah, so that's that's those are those problems, right?" And then you have to have to deal with the budget. Like, all right, now these are all the problems that we can't do because we don't have enough time to do this. And here's my actual team. These are the guys who are actually putting these together. And this guy's got these personal issues, and these this guy's got all these issues over here. And then you've got the producers, the people who are actually paying for the game, and they have got all their major issues that they got to make have all come together. And if you're a typical person and you walk into the scenario, your reaction is going to be, that's messed up. I don't want to, screw games, I'm getting out of this crap. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're the kind of person, if you're that one, one point, or point one five percent of people who says, yeah, <laughs> I want to do this, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You've got what it takes to do this. And so that's kind of like how I see trailers, and that's why like um, so there's there's two things that like get me up in the morning, and this, uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the second one, but like if you're gonna talk to me when I'm like barely out of bed, I'm probably not gonna be able to function as a human being, but I will be able to talk about video games, and I'll be able to talk about theology, and like I'll be able to talk about video game trailers. Like past that, don't try to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so once I realize those are the things that like I could always talk about, even when I'm like like barely able to keep my eyes open and have like an intellectual conversation about I'm like all right this is this this makes sense to me this is what I want to do um and if you if you find something along those lines like it's taken me my career's my career in, in video production and, and media and all those things is is taken over uh 13 years of my life so uh for for me to figure it out within that time is is a, is not terrible um <laughs> I was gonna say I've spent a lot more than thirteen years trying to figure it out. So yeah, yeah, and a lot of people. Yeah, same I mean, here. Most I'm folks... a full time dad with a PhD. I'm doing something right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, like it just takes a long time to figure these things out. And most people assume like the moment like I, I meant I, one of the many things I do is mentor teens, and they're always like, you know, what I, I want to make video games. I want to do video games. I'm like, all right, so what are you doing right now? I'm like, they'll be like, uh. Playing video games? Yeah, playing yeah, play video games. Um, and I'm like, the one guy who said, hey, hey, uh, where do I get start started programming? What's the best tool for figuring that out? And I'm like, that's Game Maker. And he's like, okay. Uh, yeah, and yeah, it is. Where should, I, where should I start with a tutorial? I'm like, uh, Tom Francis has this amazing series. Go and start with that. And he gets back to me a week later, and he's like, all right, here's a game. I'm like, okay. This is a guy who actually is taking it seriously. Yeah. I have a lot of respect so, for Tom Francis, actually. That's uh, that's a cool connection. We did a show talking about uh, it, was a, it was a whole whole show okay. on mm-hmm. his uh, recent game, Gunpoint or, or Gunpoint yeah. signature. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The show oh, yeah, the show's right, on right. Gunpoint. I think we talked about his his upcoming game as well. Yeah, we did. Yeah, his signature. True. Is it yeah, out? Yeah, cool. Is no, signature it, out? it'll be it'll be uh, it's probably a couple months away. Um, oh, okay. He hasn't he hasn't established a date yet. 
Um, that that so, sounds yeah, like Tom yeah. Francis. Yeah. I, think that, I think that was what it was. I think that was, yeah. Um, I think that was uh, when you invited me onto the show and you said, like, hey, uh, this is our show. And I looked at it and I'm like, oh, they, they did this deep dive into Gunpoint. I can do this show. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. See? <laughs> cool, cool. Cut from the same cloth. Wow. Yeah. What a fantastic conversation. Um, can you take us out by kind of talking to us about your um, your process, your workflow? Yeah. Where you know, Obviously, you've, you've been talking this whole time about, uh, what is important and what goes in, but where do you where do you start? Yeah, and how yeah. do you know you're done? Yeah. Okay. So um, the two things that are the most important is I wanna I wanna meet someone uh, and talk like we're talking right now, like we're over Skype. I hope that's not a huge spoiler for your audience. <laughs> but um, like to have a face to face, actually like see you know like I talk with my hands a lot over Skype, a lot more than I do in person, which is weird. Um, but uh, to see a person face to face, and and I I ask one simple question. All right, and a lot more. But the first one I ask is. Tell me about your game. It's not really a question, but like, yeah, like, just tell me about your game. And when you ask that of a person, and you know, this is something. This is a person's baby. This is a developer's baby. This is someone that they've they've spent so much of their heart, soul, life, time, everything on. A lot of love, yeah. Yeah. So, of course, that's what they want to talk about. <laughs> and and that that kind of just naturally goes into. Uh, I just kind of play off of that. I just ask a lot of questions about what are the strengths, what are the challenges, what is the player experience like. Um, and what are the challenges? What are the things that players have loved the most about your game? What are the things that players have really not enjoyed about your game? Um, and once I feel like I have those things, then I ask them for a build. Give me your game. I get my hands in it. I get. I get. I, I, I try to like just go to town with it, and then I come back to them and I'm like, all right, I have this idea, and I think that this is going to. This is this is how we're going to show your game and how it connects with players. And I rarely get people who come back to me and are like. You don't. You didn't. Actually, I've never ever had anyone who come back to me and said, "All right, you really don't understand the heart and spirit of my game." <laughs> and and so like that that for me is like my core is like I want to capture the I want to capture what you love about your game. What 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 people are going to love about your game is that that again is an emotional connection. But like if you can capture that and then transfer that into whatever you what do you whatever you even show, it doesn't even necessarily matter. If you can convey that emotional range and experience. Of a game, people are going connect. You're, it's going to connect with people. I mean, like that's the whole reason why No Man's Sky has connected with people because it's that whole like looking up to the stars and saying I want to go there, and then you you try to do it. And whether or not that means that you have to you know do all these other crappy things that you don't want to do in real life doesn't even matter. It's that that aspiration, that like ability to dream, that like the reason why so. Uh, the developers at Hello Games even started making that game. They're like, right. I want to try to make this some, something for players. And while it didn't deliver for everybody, it doesn't even matter. It's the fact that they they were like, this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to try to do it. And hopefully it gets people to see that. Uh, I would say it probably does matter, but well, <laughs> that's just, I'm very cynical. I actually called the game not living up because the hype was way too high. One man's hype. There's, yeah, there was just no way that it was ever going to live up to that because the trailers were so... When I saw it, I thought the trailers were actually quite ambiguous about what the game was no, going to be. No, they totally are. That's the point. And like, if you have if you have eyes to see and ears to hear how a game is coming across in a trailer, you should be able to, to trigger those red flags. Like, I never would have. Oh, yeah. Like, like I, I didn't pre-order. I didn't even anticipate the idea of pre-ordering that game. Yeah, same. Because I knew that the actual mechanical interactions, the day in day out moments of the game, would be probably boring. Yeah. Um. Because I mean, well, I, I also. I mean, you have the same advantage of, you know, just being deeply read um, and, and knowing kind of like what a person isn't saying is often what they're actually saying. Um, mm -hmm. And, and wow, how to... That's, that's good. <laughs> and, how, and how to process that because what, what you do show and what you do say in a game and how much you put forward and how much you fully reveal of those systems and interactions, especially with sound effects. Like, the thing I can't stand is when a game trailer doesn't have sound effects and they don't have sound design. So it's one thing if you don't have sound effects, but you have really great sound design, like the Hyperlight Drifter trailers. Like, they don't have sound effects in most of them, um, but you feel the emotions of each interaction and scene because of the way that they compose the sound in those trailers. Um, and people are like walk away from that like that's going to be that's going to create some good feels. Mm -hmm. um, but when you make a game trailer and you don't have any sound effects whatsoever because you realize it's a pain in the butt to capture a game just without sound and it's boring to play a game without uh, music um, because that's takes out the vibe, the feel, the flow. Of course it does. But mm -hmm. if you're making a game trailer, you know that that's like part of the 
part of the par for the course. Um, a lot of the developers don't do that, and so they end up not having footage that is uh, able to show the sound effects. Um, and then, and then you have to do it the hard way, the sound designer way of going back in afterwards in post and adding all the sound effects if you really want to make them all hit and chime in. Sometimes I've had to do that just because. Um, well, when you have a sound designer that, that's like really, really loves the game and just one, wants to make it have just the right amount of snare and punch and all those things at the right moments, mm -hmm. that's when a trailer really, really sings because it the, the sound effects are the player's actions, the player's motive, the, the player's interactions with the game, and that captures their voice. That that's you're hearing the player when you hear the sounds. Yeah, that's true. And so that's that to me is like if you're not doing that, then you better be like doing some masterful masterful intentional silence um but any, anyway sorry sorry um what was the question <laughs> <laughs> well the, the the last question is i guess um how do you know when you're done oh uh, yeah 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 uh <laughs> sorry i just maniacally laugh um <laughs> <laughs> you, <did. laughs> you don't really um it's kind of like how much Oh, that was one of the other things that Jason Vandenberg always said uh, that I really, really liked. It was like, all right, um, you, you kind of has to have this game production loop, right? You have just imagine a circle for those who are, who are aren't able to see me with my hands in the air. Um, so at the beginning, you have this like which would be everyone, <laughs> which, is, which is which is pretty much everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the very, very top, you have um, what you want your game to be. And then, and then you have the amount of time that you have to spend on that. So then you have you're going halfway around the circle, and you're like, all right. Uh, so here's here's where we are with the game, and then you have a question: Is it good? No, it's not good yet. Okay, can we can we go back around? Well, do we have money? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, then we, it has to stop. Then. <laughs> do we have money? Yes. Okay. Then we can try again. <laughs> then we can. See, iterate. the answer is you keep going till you run out of money. <laughs> yeah, hmm. I always knew that was the answer. <laughs> We're out of money, we're out of time. Yeah. I guess. We're out of money, we're out of time, we're out of resources, we're out of the ability to work on it. Those are those are those are the real things. It's like you kind of have to look, approach it from a business standpoint of like, do we can we continue um, and continue to iterate and try to be as fail fail quickly as possible. Try to be as uh, build things in like velocity. Like uh, Marlon Weeb is one of my other favorite game trailer creators. He made uh, the trailer for Darkest Dungeon, for example. Um, Marlon Weeb's website, uh, check him out. He does he does he does work better than me most of the time, um, probably all the time. Uh, <laughs> But um, there's there's a few things that I, I think that I'd do better than him, but I, I, I and I would probably say that to his face anyway. But um, when you get to uh, the the creation of uh, something that is really really good and captures that full experience, you can just hope that you've done everything right, or you can start from the very very beginning and say, all right, I'm going to cut this together really fast and really ugly, uh, really crappy first drafts. I think is what what uh. Some some authors create this, but if you write something really bad and really fast, you can find out very quickly um, what is and isn't working. Um, and so when you when you create a trailer like that is really trashy right off the bat, good um, because then you can iterate on it. Uh, you can find out specifically what is and isn't working, shift it around. Um, and I would love to say that like I only hand things off to clients that look really really great, but that's a lie. And most of the time, it looks like complete garbage, and they're like. Uh, did we choose the right guy for this? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, all right. And I, I've learned, I had to get good at being like, all right, all right, it's going to look really bad. <laughs> but trust me here, this is just to make sure that we get the general sense of flow, the timing, the shots, the content, mm -hmm. and then we can make it look really sexy. And, right. and, once you get, mm -hmm. and once you get through that process, then it's like, all right, all right, I trust this guy again. Uh, well, yeah, it's, like a, it's, typically like, it's like a storyboard when, or a prototype or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. We call it an media. animatic. Right. Yeah, an any, animatic. Any animatic. Essay or yeah. anything. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's first draft be, yeah, or yeah. drafting. And so, drafting is huge. Yeah. And so once once I get through that stage, typically it's right around the time when uh, a sound designer, sound composer that I've we've that that is originally working on the game. I'm like, all right, you're gonna take your pass with everything that I have here, make it sound good. Um, and as soon as I do that, it's like, oh wait, this skeleton actually has flesh and bones on it. Uh, it actually has sinew and and it actually it, it can dance, like it actually moves. Past that, it just looks like lifeless bones half the time. Um, but it's it's it knowing like for me my job is to figure out the knowing of like all right I know that this is just a skeleton but this is it's going to look really great when it gets everything else on it. 
And so you you know it's you know it's done when like it no longer looks like a de- dead lifeless skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> that is the greatest metaphor ever. <laughs> wow, I mean we could we could talk about this subject for forever, but uh, we are yeah. actually out of time. Cool. So uh, thank you so much, Josh, for yeah, joining sure. us. Now we we can find you at mjoshua.com In all mm-hmm. seriousness, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us, everybody, for episode seventy nine of the Backward Dash Compatible podcast uh thank you for being with us josh yeah sure yeah fun. thanks for thanks for joining us yeah and thank you so much for for talking to me and being a place that i can make random hand gestures that you're able to, to cue me into like no no, no you should probably that say no that one will see yeah, yeah that no one will see <laughs> that, that's great uh no, you, you <laughs> you're a hand talker on the radio i love it uh, but anyway i'm doc i'm jim i'm josh bye everybody bye we want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. All right, well, we're uh, we're recording too. I hope. Yes. Okay, we are. We've been <laughs> recording really, for quite a while. We have. Yeah. I just I wanted to make sure. You cut out that part where we we spent about ten minutes um, bashing Chris, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. He, he okay, good. Never hear. Okay, that good, good.